people have to live in, in unity. We are still in transition. Civil society has been decimated. Of course we rely on media. And I think the government has not done enough. The international community has failed to respond. No place in the world is perfect. Hello viewers, I'm your host Uzma Jafri with another episode of South Asia Focus. Let's begin the show. India held two highest level talks and discussions with its two allies, Japan and Australia, last week as Prime Minister Narendra Modi hosted Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida in capital New Delhi and held a virtual summit with Australian PM Scott Morrison. Both Japan and Australia are members of the Quadrilateral Security Dialogue, Quad, that has enhanced its cooperation in recent times to keep any threats in the Indo-Pacific at bay. Nearly three and a half years after the previous bilateral summit, Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi and his Japanese counterpart Fumio Kishida met in the Indian capital New Delhi for the 14th India-Japan Annual Summit. Apart from discussing the entire gamut of bilateral ties, the two sides reiterated their commitment to take the relation to newer heights in coming times. Apart from the strategic component, both Tokyo and New Delhi have been working together to enhance the relationship on all fronts. In 2020, the two countries signed an acquisition and cross-servicing agreement that allows for reciprocal stocks of food, fuel and other supplies between defence forces. In recent years, Japan has supported India's urban infrastructure development and provided funds for a high-speed railway based on its bullet train technology. Japan will be investing nearly $42 billion in India in the coming time. In the five years, 5 trillion yen, 5 trillion yen, means the meeting that came amidst escalating Russia-Ukraine crisis also discussed the duo's response towards what Kishida described as a war that has shaken the foundation of international order. While Japan has imposed sanctions on dozens of Russian individuals and organizations since the start of what Russia calls its special military operation in Ukraine and has accepted Ukrainian refugees, India is the only Quad member not to have condemned the invasion. However, it has urged peace from both parties. The government of India has also been proactively sending all forms of assistance to Ukrainians who have fled and have found themselves stranded in the war. The two sides also said that they were working to make the Indo-Pacific more open and more free. <laughs> ま、Indian Prime Minister also held a virtual summit with Australian Prime Minister Scott Morrison to discuss both the bilateral ties and the degrading situation of Russia-Ukraine war and committed to work even strongly to avoid any similar conflict in the Indo-Pacific. Morrison also said that cooperation between like-minded liberal democracies was the key to an open, inclusive, resilient and prosperous Indo-Pacific. While we are obviously distressed at the terrible situation in Europe, um, our focus, of course, is always very much on what is occurring in the Indo-Pacific and ensuring that those events uh, could never occur here in the Indo-Pacific. 
The Australian government is investing over 280 million US dollars to boost cooperation with India to further grow its economic relationship and support jobs and businesses in both countries, the Australian government said in a press statement on Tuesday. In 2020, India was Australia's seventh largest trading partner with two-way trade valued at 24.3 billion US dollars and the sixth largest goods and services export market valued at 16.9 billion US dollars. In 2020, India was Australia's third largest market for services exports. India's ties with Quad countries have improved significantly in the past few years and their regular engagements have underlined that this alliance will only get stronger with time. India, United States, Japan and Australia are members of the Quad, an informal group that Washington has been promoting to work as a potential bulwark against China's increasing political, commercial and military activity in the Indo-Pacific. Moving on, it has been nearly a month since the island nation Sri Lanka plunged into an acute economic crisis and what has been referred to as one of the country's most stressing moments to date. The people of Sri Lanka are reeling under soaring inflation and massive shortages of fuel, gas and even everyday staples. The government, meanwhile, has announced that it will reach out to the World Bank after President Gotabaya Rajapaksa said last week that Colombo was relying on International Monetary Fund for a bailout. Serpentine queues, hours of waiting with no certainty of getting the required amount of fuel or food, Hapley Sri Lankans are enduring the most troubled phase of their lives as the island nation grapples with a rapidly deteriorating economic crisis. It has triggered a situation of unrest where people led by opposition parties have taken to the streets demanding the country's government to go. In the latest government decision, Colombo has deployed the military at gasoline stations calling it a preventive measure to avoid chaos and conflicts. A 70% drop in foreign exchange reserves since January 2020 has left Sri Lanka struggling to pay for essential imports including gasoline. The situation has also paved way for unprecedented inflation with prices of everyday commodities skyrocketing by the day. The sales graph is sagging and price indices have spiked suddenly. The government said it will seek World Bank assistance to stave off a severe economic crisis in addition to an International Monetary Fund rescue plan to be discussed next month. As per the sources, to seek a way out of the crisis, Finance Minister Basil Rajapaksa will fly to Washington DC next month to hold talks with the IMF and also officials from the World Bank. The World Bank typically extends support to boost exports, improve economic competitiveness and aid growth. Holding paltry reserves of $2.31 billion as of February, the country has to repay about $4 billion in debt over the rest of this year, including a $1 billion international sovereign bond that matures in July. Unrestrained inflation, people say, has become a matter of grave concern as they are finding it hard to purchase even everyday essentials. Hmm. 
ලංකා මිනිස්සු ඔක්කොම මට විතරක් නෙමෙයි මේක ලංකා මිනිස්සු ඔක්කොට මේ සිද්ධ වෙන දෙයක් මිනිස්සුන්ට මැරෙන්න තමයි වෙන්නේ මොනුත් කැම්බීම නැතුව සල්ලි තිබ්බට වෙලාවට කණ්ඩ නැහැ කණ්ඩ බඩු ගන්න නැහැ වෙලාවකට බඩු තියෙනවා සල්ලි නැහැ දැන් මිනිසුන්ට කොච්චර සල්ලි තිබ්බත් ගන්න බඩු නැහැ පිටි ටික නැහැ සීනි ටික නැහැ Earlier after the appeal made by the Central Bank of Sri Lanka the government had imposed curbs on the import of non-essential commodities including fish footwear and wine In what could be termed as a shot in the arm to its efforts at securing some funds the government has also received aid in the form of a credit line of 1 billion dollars from its neighbor India China too is considering a 2.5 billion dollars loan to pull it out of the crisis. The government of Sri Lanka had assured last month that the crisis won't last more than a few days, but the current situation indicates that the crisis is not just widening across the island, but is set to bring troubles that will not just damage the country's economic dynamics, but will simply become unmanageable for the Rajpaksa government. Moving on. In a major twist in developments from Afghanistan, the Taliban have reneged on their promises of not obstructing girls from getting educated. The decision that has drawn international concern and condemnation came this Wednesday when the group decided to bar girls above the 6th grade from going to school. They said the order would remain in place until a plan was drawn up in accordance with the Islamic law for schools to reopen. This is Khadija, a 16-year-old Afghan student who stayed up all night in excitement when her school was set to reopen after months. However, soon after she reached her school, her emotions turned into disappointment after the ruling Taliban ordered girls' school above 6th grade to remain shut until further orders. As per the statement issued by a Doha-based senior Taliban leader, Suhain Shaheen, the decision was taken owing to a technical issue and a lack of standardized uniforms for students around the country. Khadija says her dreams have come crashing down. No matter how hard it was going to be, she wanted to be a doctor. تا اگر سفرم شروع می شد تا بلندترینش من اقدر خوش داشتم دکتری در دا زیاد چپن سفر در زیاد خوش داشتم چون من زیاد دکتری در دا خوش دارم دیگه چی کنیم دیگه شد اجازه داده نشد و اندام کلش به خاک یکسان شد The international community has been urging Taliban leaders to open schools and give women their right to public space Before the sudden decision, a statement by the ministry earlier in the week had urged all students to come to school. Observers say the decision to postpone a return of girls going to school in higher levels appeared to be a concession to the rural and deeply tribal backbone of the hardline Taliban movement that in many parts of the countryside are reluctant to send their daughters to school. Others however have objected that appeasement cannot be the basis of any policy especially when the girls's future is at stake the girls they say are losing their hopes وقتی که شنید مکتب شروع شد زیاد ایجانی بودم زیاد خوشحال بودم ات تا گفتن که روز نوروز شروع میشه من به شوق علاقه رفتم در نوروز به خود چیز دیگه نگرفتم چادر مکتب گرفتم به خاطر مکتب شروع میشه از خاطر کتابای ما تیار کردم با اینکه ما تیار کردم بسیار به شوق تا یک ضربه خوردیم که دیگه اصلا هم باور ما نمیشه Since the Taliban took over control in August, the international community has made the education of girls a key demand for any future recognition of their rule. 
United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres said that the Taliban's decision to suspend high school for girls in Afghanistan was a profound disappointment and deeply damaging for Afghanistan. The Secretary General deeply regrets today's announcement by the Taliban authorities in Afghanistan that girls' education from the sixth grade has been suspended until further notice. The start of the new year has been anticipated by all students, girls and boys, and parents and families. The de facto authorities' failure to reopen school for girls above the sixth grade, despite repeated commitments, is a profound disappointment and deeply damaging for Afghanistan. The Secretary General says that the denial of education not only violates the equal rights of women and girls to education, it also jeopardizes the country's future in view of the tremendous contributions by Afghan women and girls. The surprise decision also comes as the movement's leadership has been summoned to southern Kandahar by the reclusive Taliban leader Haibatullah Akhunzada, amid reports of a cabinet shakeup. There have been persistent reports since the Taliban takeover of differences among the senior leadership with the more hardline among the movement at odds with the pragmatists among them. The pragmatists reportedly want to see a greater engagement with the world and while staying true to their Islamic beliefs, be less harsh than when they last ruled Afghanistan, banning women from work and girls from schools. So there are a number of reasons being speculated behind the sudden call. But for now, the classroom's door are shut and it is up to the Taliban only as to when they will reopen, if they do at all. Time now for Asia This Week, the stories from across the continent. National flag carrier Vietnam Airlines has temporarily suspended regular flights from Hanoi to Moscow starting from March 25 until further notice. The suspension was to review procedures, requirements and regulations related to flight operations in Russia. The two countries have close ties dating back to Soviet era and Vietnam has not so far condemned Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Vietnam Airlines was the only Vietnamese carrier operating at a regular route to Russia. A visa exemption policy for citizens from Russia and 23 other countries remains in place according to local media outlet VN Express. Vietnam reopened the country to foreign visitors on March 15. Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi met his Indian counterpart Subramaniam Jayashankar in New Delhi this week amidst deepening Ukraine-Russia crisis. This was the first visit by a top Chinese official since border clashes between the two sides in 2020. Media said he had already met India's powerful national security adviser Ajit Doval. The top Chinese diplomat visited Pakistan and Afghanistan this week and flew to Nepal later in the day on a whirlwind tour of South Asia where China is trying to deepen its influence. Wang drew a rebuke from the Indian government ahead of his trip for remarks in Pakistan this week on the disputed Kashmir region. Malaysia is about to reopen its border for tourists and people in Malacca are looking forward to the recovery of tourism. The Malaysian government announced that the country will reopen its borders to international tourists since April 1, 2022. All tourists completing the COVID-19 vaccination are no longer required to be quarantined but have to undertake nucleic acid tests on departure and arrival. Tourism is a major contributor to Malaysia's economy. According to the Department of Statistics Malaysia, Tourism in Malaysia accounted for 15.9% of the gross domestic product in 2019, with foreign tourists and Malaysians accounting for 49.1% and 50.9% of the total tourism expenditure respectively.
Moving on, merriment and mirth go around the year in India's northeastern state of Manipur and Yoshang holds a special place in the festive calendar of the region. It is a blend of both the Hindu customs and indigenous traditions. It was celebrated with immense fervor in the state. Have a look. The state of Manipur got soaked in the festive spirit of joy as it celebrated its most awaited festival of Yao Shang, the five-day extravaganza that marks the onset of spring. On the first day of the festival, a small hut, also known as Yao Shang, is constructed with bamboos and straws. Inside it, the idol of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, the founder of Gauda Vaishnavism, is kept. The devotees keep a number of sweets and candles in front of the hut. As the sun sets, a ritualistic arti is performed and after the sweets are distributed among the devotees, the hut which is regarded as the symbol of good over evil is burnt. As part of the festival, young boys and girls dressed in traditional attire go from door to door for monetary donations or nakatang. They take special delight in this activity and the money collected is spent on merrymaking. Music concerts are also organized at various places to celebrate the festival. On the second day, groups of local bands travel to the city's Govindji temple while singing devotional hymns accompanied by musical instruments such as dhokals, cymbals and seashells. They converge at the temple to celebrate Pichkari Numit or Pichkari Day. Pichkari is a water gun commonly used to squirt coloured water during the festival. After offering special prayers at the temple and performing all the religious rituals, devotees drench each other in coloured powders and water, just like the holy festival is celebrated across the country. It's beautiful to experience Holi like this, such colourful and so rooted to the culture. Women all beautifully dressed up and, you know, giving all importance to the flowers and the colours around. So it's beautiful to see men and women enjoying Holi here in the temple. Ready, go! The five-day sports festival held in every nook and corner of the state is another important aspect of Yaoshang celebration. This is the most remarkable difference between the Holi festival in Manipur and other parts of the country. A number of games like cricket, football, volleyball are organized during the event. In modern times, there has been a trend of channeling the festive energy towards sporting event to spot out talent at the grassroots level and Yaoshang festival is a great example of it. Wholesome festivals like this added a new component to Indian celebrations. With that, we come to the end of this week's episode. See you next week. Goodbye and take care. Subscribe Tag TV YouTube channel and press the notification button.